Tonight on Next, an in-depth look at the causes of Colorado's most destructive fire. Two fires merged into a monster. While it took time, I can confidently say that we know what happened and why. A thousand homes and two lives lost. Prosecutors say they can't prove it was a crime. We're digging into why the religious sect doing burns on its property is protected by what law enforcement told them and why Excel is not being charged with a crime for its malfunctioning power line. A familiar face to next viewers, now working in California, explains why the big utility out there has been forced to pay up for big fires. And we break down how a wet spring, like the one we're in now, increased the risk of a mega fire close to Christmas. Inside the Marshall Fire, tonight on Next. The most destructive fire in Colorado history. Then a year and a half wait. Today, some answers. Investigators say the Marshall Fire was actually two fires that became one. The fire started on a religious sex property and from a faulty XL power line. The first started on a residential property at 5325 El Dorado Springs Drive shortly after 11 a.m. Further investigation determined that the most likely cause of the second fire was hot particles discharged from an XL Energy power line. That's Boulder County Sheriff Curtis Johnson, who lost his own home in the fire, one of a thousand homes that burned in a fire that also killed two Coloradans. Despite the damage, despite the loss of life, Boulder County DA Michael Doherty says he will not be bringing criminal charges for the two fires. The first ignition point was on the property owned by the religious sect called the 12 Tribes. Investigators say a fire they had burning there six days before the Marshall Fire reignited on December 30th. Heavy winds pushed that fire east, where investigators say it eventually merged with a second fire that they say was likely sparked by an XL power line. Investigators say they cannot completely rule out the possibility that it was an underground coal mine fire that was the second ignition point instead of the XL line, but they say that is not likely. Marshall Zellinger kind of specializes in asking XL Energy questions that the utility would rather not answer. This is the first time, Marshall, though, that you've been asking them about issues of life and death. Usually it's about our bills, finances, money, something like that. But in this case, with two people who passed away in the fire and people impacted, it's a very serious question. Last year, we got viewer video sent to us showing an arcing power line over Highway 93 here, kind of like on those lines where those barbell looking things are. That is not what investigators are talking about when they reference Excel's cause of the fire. Instead, it's the three power lines that go from pole to pole. And there's one down there where that bird is sitting. The far left power line was not attached to where it was supposed to be. This photo evidence from the Marshall Fire investigation shows a hanging power line, not touching the ground, just floating. It turns out a viewer who shared fire video with us last year caught the same thing. Oh, wow. Edward Harrell was shooting video of the smoke plume at 12.05 p.m. on December 30th, 2021, when he captured that same power line no longer attached to the top of the pole. Investigators believe that caused hot aluminum particles to start a second fire separate from the 12 tribes fire. Seems more probable and more likely that it was the Excel wire as opposed to embers from 2,000 feet away or the coal seam vents that caused the fire. I recognize that Excel may not share that view. Excel does not. In part of a statement provided to us, the company wrote, we strongly disagree with any suggestion that Excel Energy's power lines caused the second ignition. It goes on to say the investigator's analyses are flawed and their conclusions are incorrect. Though part of the investigation references a text message from one Excel lineman to his manager saying something to the effect of, I think our lines may have started this fire east of El Dorado just for your situational awareness. I feel that somebody should be responsible for the people that died. George Kumpfner lived near Sagamore in Superior. He lost his home and he lost precious memories. My videos of the boys playing ball, that's gone. And I can't get it back, no way. He got an attorney last year to file a lawsuit against Excel seeking class action status. That was before today's announcement by investigators that Excel shares blame. Well, I think it gave our lawsuit some some steroids. Attorney James Avery believes the people he represents suing Excel should be entitled to double the value of the homes they lost. I don't think they're going to be able to keep the same profit margin if they have to pay damages to these victims. And a second class action lawsuit was filed this morning 
against Excel. I should point out, investigators did not notice the thing about the power line originally because Excel repaired that line, and investigators say they don't believe Excel was doing anything to cover anything up, but rather just get power back on to people who needed it immediately after the fire and when that snowstorm came, Kyle. But prevented investigators from taking a look because they obviously went out there and did the fix. Again, Marshall, I see Mar uh, they're saying that Excel did not have time to review the law enforcement analyses, but yet they reject the law enforcement right. analyses that they did not view. It sounds like they reject the conclusion that their line sparked part of the fire, and they're not really interested in any analyses that would contradict their view. No, and they point out the coal seam fire, or the coal seams that are burning underneath where this is. Again, investigators pointed out that they could, they said this is a probable cause, but they could not rule out the coal seams. They're just saying it's not the coal seams and that this was more likely the cause. Legal language that Excel will use in these class action lawsuits or the attempt of a class action lawsuit mm -hmm. to say, hey, investigators even say they cannot say for certain we were the reason. Marshall Zellinger, thank you for your reporting on this. That video of the Excel lines, again, not released by the sheriff's office. We found it through our exhaustive investigation of every known video of the first hours of the fire. Our Chris Vanderveen and photojournalist Chris Hansen spent months going through these videos, pinpointing the time and the location. You can see the largest database of videos of the Marshall Fire at marshallfiremap.com. You can go minute by minute through that fire spread. So we're still working to figure out how those ongoing class action suits against Excel are going to affect customers, not just there in Boulder County, but across the state potentially. It is very significant that we learned today that Excel is not going to face criminal liability. Consider what happened in California, where the utility Pacific Gas and Electric, PG&E, has been found criminally liable for several fires. In 2020, PG&E pleaded guilty to 84 counts of manslaughter after faulty equipment sparked the 2018 campfire. PG&E has paid out billions of dollars in settlements. I want to bring in our former colleague, Brandon Riddiman now. Brandon works for our sister station out in Sacramento, and he has done the definitive reporting on PG&E's responsibility for fires in California. Brandon, welcome back, first of all. I want to ask you, what did it take to get to the point that you had a utility company held criminally liable for people's deaths? Yeah, so really what happened was investigators, Kyle, and it is good to be speaking with you again. What, what happened was investigators took a look at the evidence. They sealed it off with crime scene tape. This was after the campfire in 2018 that destroyed the town of Paradise, put armed guards down at the base of this dirt road and said nobody comes in here until we've had a look at the evidence. So that's a stark distinction between what you're dealing with and what happened out here. But when they got a look at the evidence, they saw there was a hook that was holding up this really high tension transmission line uh, that had worn down over over decades to the point where there's just a little thin nub of metal left. And, and basically, they were able to work up a case to build to criminal negligence, showing that the company, not any specific individual at PG&E that they could put behind bars, but the company, the corporation itself, knew about this problem, knew that it created a high risk of injury or death, and then went ahead with these practices anyway of not properly in inspecting, uh, inspecting and maintaining its system. And PG&E ultimately did plead guilty as charged to the 84 counts of felony and voluntary manslaughter, as well as reckless arson. And, and Brandon, so in this case, as Marshall was just talking about, Excel went out, took the lead on equipment repairs following the fire, so investigators never got a firsthand look like they did after the campfire. Given what has happened out in California as a result of your reporting and public awareness about it, is it changing the way that that utility operates? Obviously, we know that the wildfire risk in California is still very significant. Yeah, I mean, they've made certainly a lot of announcements about trying to prevent wildfires in the future, but the reality is that PG&E power lines have been named as the cause of a large destructive fire every year since, uh, going all the way back to 2017, uh, including the Mosquito Fire last year, at least is under investigation by the U.S. Forest Service, and parts have been seized. So uh, it is an ongoing problem at PG&E, and critics would say that the company really hasn't owned up to this core fundamental problem of putting profits over safety. And I got to say, on this XL thing, um, you know, I, I think the fact that investigators didn't get in there and really get their hands on any of this evidence for a couple of weeks until after the snow had fallen and then melted away, really, it, it just it leads to a botched result. There are going to be questions that just aren't going to be answered. And that's the real tragedy in this. 
well, we are happy to pick up that baton and take it from there. Wish you was under better circumstances, but Brandon Riddiman, it is good to see you again and appreciate your expertise as always. Thank you, my friend. Today's report was much clearer about the initial starting points for the fire. And the first one was on that property owned by the 12 Tribes Religious Group. Our Kevin Vaughn from our 9 Wants to Know investigative team has been talking to us for months now. That, Kevin, this property was the, one of the focuses of the fire investigation, but we learned some new information today. Kyle, we now have a clear picture of exactly what happened on that property and the role it played in igniting the Marshall Fire. On Christmas Eve 2021, firefighters, a sheriff's deputy, and a park ranger checked out this fire on 12 Tribes property and deemed it safe. They approved the plan to bury it after it burned out. Six days later, high winds uncovered embers still smoldering there and ignited the Marshall Fire. Today, District Attorney Michael Doherty said there is no evidence the people who started that fire did anything wrong. And if we were to tell you that we were filing charges today, I imagine some people would cheer that decision because of how much people have suffered in this community. That cheering would come to an abrupt stop in about six weeks because we'd have our first court hearing. We have, we, have, we have to show a judge that we have evidence to move forward with a criminal prosecution and a judge would dismiss this prosecution for a, a lack of any evidence. We stopped by the 12 tribes property this afternoon. The person there declined to comment on today's report. Kevin, it seems if you're Excel or if you're 12 tribes, what prosecutors said today is essentially going to be your defense if you ever get hauled into court on it. Absolutely. I mean, in the 12 tribes place, the DA pointed out that the fact that firefighters, a sheriff's deputy and a, a, a park ranger had been there and checked out that fire six days earlier mm -hmm. made it impossible to file charges. Kevin Vaughn, thank you. The weather we saw in the year leading up to the Marshall Fire created that recipe for disaster. And a migrant arriving in Denver says Florida was her first choice. Then she realized what's going on in Florida these days. Her story next. We talked a lot today about the immediate causes of the Marshall Fire in Boulder County. Take a step back now and look at some of the longer term factors that created those conditions for a mega fire. Remember, at the end of December. The fire was pushed by incredibly high winds that day, and it was fueled by a ton of vegetation. It was greenery that had grown during an exceptionally wet spring in 2021 and then dried out during a hot, dry stretch of about six months that followed. Investigators pointed to those factors today, but these are issues that have been the focus of climate change studies since the fire happened. Climate scientists at the University of, Boulder, or University of Colorado Boulder say that the warming climate contributed to both the heavy spring rain in 2021 and the drought that followed. Well, we have seen a very rainy season so far. Some areas still getting those light showers. We're at 75 degrees at DIA, dry but very cloudy. Winds coming in from the east southeast at just three miles per hour. As you take a look at Colorado here, you can see we have some spotty showers and storms all across the state. Most of the stronger storms are going to be in the northern portions of the plains. We even have a strong storm pushing its way through the springs and then into the high country and foothills area. Denver still looking pretty dry. As we go through the rest of the evening, we're going to stay mostly cloudy. Those spotty storms will start to move out overnight lows pretty mild in the middle 50s and as you make way for your Friday we're going to see temperatures pretty warm in the low 80s we're going to start the day dry and partly cloudy then we're going to see a midday cloud cover push in and another round of those scattered to isolated storms for tomorrow though we do have areas central and southern portions of the plains and into the front range here where we have a marginal risk for severe weather where we're going to watch for strong storms and then this yellow area is enhanced rich which uh, enhanced area which means those storms could be even stronger over the next few days, we're going to see these temperatures dropping. We're in the low 80s for our Friday as we go into the weekend. We're in the middle 70s and upper 60s for our high Sunday. If you're making those weekend plans, you want to watch for Sunday to be more of a washout day. And then those temperatures start to rebound as we go into next week. Florida's new immigration crackdown is having ripple effects beyond that state, forcing migrants to search for new opportunity in places like Denver. That's next. While Colorado's leaders push the federal government for ways to get migrants work permits faster, Florida's Republican leaders are trying to make it harder for newcomers to work legally there. And people are naturally going to move in the direction of opportunity. Our Angelina McCall spoke with a migrant who wished to be in Miami, but she instead has come to Colorado. 
Yeah, just recently within the past week. And the laws that Governor DeSantis put into place just went into effect at the start of this month. So now it would be a felony, for instance, to give transportation to someone without proper documentation into the state of Florida. It also invalidates out-of-state driver's licenses issued to immigrants who don't have permanent status. And one of the most significant parts is that it requires companies with 25-plus employees to use a federal system to confirm that employees are eligible to work. One migrant I spoke to says she saw the impact that it was already having. Después que sacaron la ley, como a los dos, tres días, no había nadie trabajando. Solamente había una persona, el encargado. No había más nadie. Adriana had hoped to stay in Miami, but with the new Florida laws, it was almost impossible for her to find work, even though she's trying to go through the process of getting a work permit or gaining asylum. It also imposes penalties on businesses who employ those without our authorization. So she was saying that she was having a hard time. She just arrived in Colorado this past week, but it was not her first option. Un poco desesperada, eh, primordialmente porque no tenía dónde llegar. Acá unas personas me dijeron que me iban a recibir, pero yo llegué y al final nunca me recibieron. Entonces, pues conocí a mi compañera acá y ella me informó sobre lo del refugio. Yo dije, bueno, <ríe> hay una opción al menos. Adriana has been applying for work and she's hoping to find some options here in Denver. You know, it's not completely dissimilar, Angeline, to some of the stories that we heard from migrants who were in Texas who were just looking to get out of the state of Texas because they felt like it was inhospitable to them as well. And I'm guessing that if you would talk to the governors of Florida and Texas, they would say that's the system working. They, they don't want their states to be hospitable to people who are in this country without documentation. And sometimes they lump in people who are in the asylum process, even those folks who have legal paperwork. Right, yeah, it certainly seems like such a strong stance to take, and it also means that people who are in the process, people who just aren't at that point of uh, permanent residency, it even puts them at a setback, mm -hmm. and so it means that people who are really early in that process, they're going to say, you know what, I feel like I'm being targeted, and despite my best efforts of trying to make this work and doing it in a legal manner, despite those efforts, I might go somewhere else. Appreciate your continued reporting on this. Angeline McCall, thank you. We're back with your feedback next. Marshall Fire Feedback, first on Excel from GM, who says, will, will they start shutting down power lines during high wind emergencies like PG&E now does in California after they were found financially liable? It's a very good question. Of course, Excel is not going to be criminally liable. We don't know if they will be civilly financially liable. Todd says on tw the 12 tribes property, if I legally build a fire, don't put it out and don't tend to it, gets out of control, how am I not liable for it? question is, will they be liable if they did everything that they were supposed to do that authorities told them to? And Jewel says, Miss Brandon Ritterman, wish he'd come back. He did fantastic work here. He's close to family now in California and still doing work that matters. See you next time.